Matthew 8, verse 23. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Matthew ten twenty seven. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven. Matthew 14, verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Mark 5, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over the boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized the power that had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, as disciples answered, and yet you asked, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. It's interesting to me that Jesus does that a few times in the word where he performs a miracle. He heals someone and then he tells them, don't say anything. On the one hand, he reveals his glory. And then on the other hand, there are times when he doesn't want people saying anything. And it's always kind of like puzzled me in a way. But the way I understand it with my own experience is you know, God's been showing me these different miracles that he's done in my life. He's been reminding me this morning of how sick I was. I mean, I was really, really sick. I was dying. And how he healed me and how he called me to himself and then taught me about himself. 
things that I don't hear anybody talking about. How can all of this picture of what he's done in my life and what he's done even since 2019 when he called me to himself, how could all of this not be real? That's it, It's sort of insanity to say that that's not real or to even think that that's not real. Even the order of how things have happened, him calling me to himself while I was dying, then healing me, talking with me about the things that he was upset about, talking with me about the churches and the universities and the uh, field of science trying to usurp and covet his glory. I didn't know anything about how that fit into scripture or end times. I knew absolutely nothing at that time. And he would talk with me in ways that I could understand until he showed me his word, until he taught me his word. Then walking this walk alone, because no one believed and no one would listen. Writing those books and then the YouTube channel and my kids were still like not, I mean, they loved me. They wanted, they believed, they saw what he had done in me, but they needed him to reveal the things that I was saying to them directly. Then years later, and I'm calling out to God and I'm telling him, please, my children, my own children, please reveal to them. And one of the hardest things that we went through in our entire lives was the my daughter's pregnancy while medicine was telling her that it was likely that she and the baby were going to die. All of that fear mongering, her going into a medical discipline and watching all of the disgusting things that they do, watching a two-year-old child die on the table, an anesthesiologist having students practice things on her like as though she was a cadaver while she was under. Then watching her die on the table and asking the anesthesiologist, so what do we do now? What do we say to the parents? And he said, nothing, she's fine. Are you kidding me? That's what happens to our children when we leave the room with these sadists who think they're gods, who think they can do whatever they want with our bodies. That's what we've been handing ourselves over to. All the fear-mongering that they were doing initially, oh, yes, yes, we'll go along with your birth plan. And then, oh, no, you have to have this procedure and you've got to have that procedure and we need to go in and we need to take that baby. And God started to make her not trust them, started to remind her of the things that she had seen. And she prayed and asked him, if you want me to have this baby without them, make it happen. Make it happen that I can't even go to the hospital. And he did. She had contractions that were two minutes apart for over 10 hours. She could not have gone to the hospital if if she could. I mean, she couldn't have gone if she wanted to. And he pushed each one of us against the wall to break that stronghold of idolatry. And that day she got more phone calls, four phone calls from the hospital. Why? Because while the stronghold's being broken... Satan's panicking. So expect it. And while Satan's panicking, he's going to pull out his bag of tricks and he's going to do everything that he thinks to do. Threaten you, make you think that you need him. And that's exactly what he did that whole time. If we had just not had that connection, well, I didn't have the connection with medicine. I haven't been, I haven't had that connection for a long time, but he had to do that with my kids. If they'd not have that had that connection, they wouldn't have experienced all of those schemes of the devil to freak them out and scare them and make them think that they that they needed him. But they kept standing in faith. A stronghold was broken. It's not even a it's not even a question anymore. Of course, God can heal us. Of course, He can be- deliver the baby. Of course, we don't need a medicalized birth. Has God not been doing that for thousands of years? Where were the hospitals back then? But the question was not just whether He could deliver a baby. But the question was, is what they're saying true? And actually it was. The placenta was calcified. There were issues in the amniotic fluid. What they were saying was true. And yet both mama and baby were healthy and healed faster than anyone I've ever seen, having been butchered in a medicalized birth. And God brought my daughter to believe the things that he's taught me, the things that I cried out to him saying, Lord, please reveal to my children. How can I continue on? How can I just be here for this amount of time and have my children not know? Please, if it's your will, reveal to them. And he did. 
and he continues to reveal to me, even as I'm going through this, he keeps talking with me. He's not talking with me about what I want to know about what's going to happen with the building and everything else. He's not talking with me about that, but he's still revealing things to me. And as he's revealing to me and, and really, you know, he could lay out the plan for me and then I could sit here every day and go, so when are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? When, 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 when? I mean, I've done that before. He told me I was going to get money for the, you know, for the building and I did that very thing. When, 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 when? There's always something that we cannot believe, that we can like justify unbelief with. There's always something our flesh is going to want to control. And I know myself that I have a tendency to look at individual situations and say, well, maybe that was this. I believe, I believe, I believe in the moment when it's happened. And then over time, I start talking myself out of it. But we have to hold on to what he's done. And we have to look at the entire picture. And I believe that that's why Jesus would say, don't tell anyone else. Because they need to believe on their own terms. Or why he only brought certain people into that room when he healed that little girl, raising her back to life. He could make things really clear. He could make things so that we hold on to that and we actually believe. But he presents certain stumbling blocks in order to test us to see if we're going to stumble on it. And one of those stumbling blocks is that we start to talk ourselves out of it. Like, okay, there could be something, some other explanation for this. It's hard to tell yourself, just don't be afraid, you know, or for somebody else to tell you, just don't be afraid. So as I was reading these scriptures this morning, I was, you know, I was remembering all the times that I've been through things like this and that it's difficult to just say, well, just don't be afraid, just trust. Well, okay, you can do that for a little while and then you explode. And the reason you explode is because you're not really acknowledging your feelings. You're just acting like you can just not be afraid. And I don't think that that's what Jesus was saying. You know, if you apply what Jesus has said in the word, don't be afraid, then the logical thing you're going to need to do is process through the feelings that you have. The feelings, by the way, that he's given you. You get in close with God when you feel fear. That's what that feeling of fear is for. But in order for you to get close with God, you got to be authentic with with yourself. You have to acknowledge the information that he's given you. And so one of the things that I will use when I'm feeling afraid is I will write, I'll I'll write a fears list. I'll write out my fears. And a lot of times what I find is that I'm able to give those things to God. And what I found this morning is that I was writing things like, I'm afraid that I haven't heard right, that I'm not his, that I haven't pleased him, that I've been tricked, that I've not done things perfectly, that I've not done, that I've done anything on my own. Okay. Okay. So as I look at that, as I look at those fears, they're ridiculous. They are ridiculous within the context of the fruit that God has born out of me of wisdom and understanding that I don't hear anybody talking about. And yet it's plain as day in the word. It's ridiculous that I would think that he's brought me all this way into his word to have understanding, bearing fruit through others who are actually applying the work, bearing fruit in my family, that I would think there's some margin of error here that I don't know about and he's going to trick me. Or, or I'm not his? That's crazy. If I'm not his, it's impossible to get into the kingdom of heaven because I know the fruit I'm bearing. I know what I do on a daily basis. I know what he's done in my life. I know what he's done through me in my children and in those who I work with. How could that be possible? You see, the devil is cunning and he's a liar and he likes to compartmentalize things so that you can't see the whole picture. He does that in research, doesn't he? He does that in science where he breaks down the creation into just a body, just a body and mind, just the flesh, and then starts breaking that down even more. First, it's the psyche. Then you're just thoughts and behaviors, cognitions and behaviors. No feelings, no heart, no experience, just Let's examine that thought and change that thought and then we'll change the behavior. Stupid. It's stupid. We buy into that stuff in psychology and we think that that God and his reality is some pseudo reality. We think that's foolish. You take a human soul and say that they are nothing more than a computer and thoughts and behaviors. That's what psychology has reduced you guys to, guys. 
You, your feelings don't even matter in psychology anymore. Neither do your experiences. Th that's too subjective. Only what can be measured. Oh, let's take the body in science. You go to a liver doctor who doesn't know anything else about how any of the rest of the body operates together. He only looks at the liver. You go to a surgeon. He doesn't know how the body operates. He only knows how to cut things out. No one seems to understand the full picture because we've been deceived by the devil who wants to compartmentalize everything. Because if you look at it in pieces, you can explain anything. But if you look at the whole picture of what God's doing... Well, then you have to acknowledge his glory. The next thing I wrote on my list is this situation seems impossible. There seems to be no way. And then I started to write. I started to do the journaling that I teach you guys to do. The tender feelings of the child inside of us. The witnessing and the shepherding of the parent inside of us. And the logical next step after I processed my feelings is to go to God and to speak to him based on the name that he has told us to use forever. The name I am that is translated into Haya, that means he was, he is, and he's being revealed. When you start speaking with God based on his actual name, instead of being superficial and thinking that some verbal name like Yahweh it's not his name. Yahweh just means God. God stated his name in a verb. So when you speak to him, in the verb that he stated his name to be, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the verbal name Haya. I'm talking about what does that name mean? That name is sacred. The meaning of that name is sacred, and it is what he's doing. I tell you all the time that when you're praying in God's name, you're praying in the will of God. You're praying in his cause and in his reputation, in his reason. And I told you that he revealed that to me long before he ever showed me that that those using the name Yahweh, that that is incorrect, that Reform Judaism decided they had the authority to turn his name into a proper noun. Why? Because God has to go by our rules. We don't go by his, apparently. No, God's name is moving. It is a verb. It is active. It is the reputation that he established, like when he says, I, I made a name for myself, it's who he is right now, what he's doing in your life, what he's building in you so that he will be revealed. It's what he's revealing about himself and what you need to be a part of as an offering to him. And if you know that he's doing something, if you know that his name is a verb and that his name and his will is active, that he is doing something in your life, then when you say things like I did, like this situation seems impossible, there seems to be no way that I'm going to keep my house. There seems to be no way that I'm going to be okay in this situation. And then you start speaking to him, knowing what his name means, that he's doing something, that he's being revealed. Now you can live in that faith. Now you don't have to be afraid. It's a process. So I don't think that that needs to be laid out for you. There's an example of how it's been lived out in the word. And now you just need to go and apply that. You need to process the feelings God has given you and meet him in who he has revealed himself to be. And the whole picture in my life shows who God is demonstrates what he's been doing. He has been revealed and he will be revealed again. I'm going to read to you what I wrote because I think that it'll be helpful in helping you to have an example of how to do this work, how to naturally bring yourself to God. Because once you've done the work, you, it, that should be the next logical step. And it's unfortunate that in Heart Known Series, when I say now bring yourself to God and receive his ministry, that people like don't understand what that means, that it's not a logical step for them. God should be in the work. He should be in the work with you. As you're sorting through those feelings, He should you should feel him there with you. And so if he's witnessing what you're doing, then the logical thing when you're done doing what your part is, is that you turn to him and then you sort through what you need to sort through with him. 
because you don't know what he's doing. Now go receive what he's doing from him. Here's the parent's response because the child has just listed out her fears. I understand that you don't have certainty. You've been betrayed and tricked before. You don't know what's going to happen or what God will do. But Hayah was before us, is everything right now, and he's being revealed. His glory is coming. We know that he's real. We know that he was, is, and will be. We only want what he wants. He's revealed so much to you. It all lines up in scripture. Your thinking is not entirely clear right now because you're up against a wall. And that part is really hard. You're up against a wall. Father, we trust you. We trust that you will reveal your glory and we want to be used for your will. Please do not delay. Please relent as soon as you know it's good. We're standing in faith again. You brought me here. No one else could have brought me to understand. You've revealed wisdom no one else has. You've testified and been revealed and you will do so again. Thank you for choosing me. Please have your way. Please strengthen me to endure this test. Please lead me to pass this test and to be built by you. That should be a logical flow that you bring yourself to God. And then he will start to talk with you. And he started to remind me that it was insane to think that someone else has wisdom or knows what's best for me in my life. That some expert, whether it's a realtor or a doctor or whatever, or a psychologist, who cares? It doesn't matter. God designed us for a purpose. How could anyone know what's best? How could anyone know what he's doing in this situation? And yet all of our training and expertise in all of that training, not once did we ever acknowledge that God has a plan. He's doing something here and we need to lean into what he's doing. No, we take the reins. We're taught to stand in the place of God and to make money off of that idolatry. Can you see why he took me out of the, the careers that I had, out of the field that I had? There, there are few fields that are more idolatrous than psychology or pastoral care, so-called pastoral care, or medicine, or legal fields. All of the important people of the world, my son is going to be a doctor, my daughter is going to be a lawyer, right? The important things of the world... Of course, the important things of the world are the most evil fields. They manipulate and distort truth, the appearance of godliness, but denying his power, the appearance of healing, but they don't acknowledge the one who heals. And he said to me, no doctor could heal you. No enchanter, no diviner, no energy healer, no dietitian or witch. Only God knows, and only God will perform miracles on his people in their lives. We can't bow down to God's or gospels of man. Only God can heal this situation. And he has told me in scripture not to be afraid. He's told me that if I endure, he gives me life as my victor's crown. He gives me joy in suffering for him. I'm his, and I will be saved, and I will be rescued. And the last thing he said to me is so many people going around saying that they're saved, thinking that they're saved or that they're going to be saved. Why are we so afraid? If we really believe that, why are we so afraid? You can't say that and mean it and still be afraid. If we're afraid, it's because there's something we're not doing. And so when I look at my list here, that I'm afraid that I haven't heard right, that I'm not his, I've not pleased him, I've been tricked, I've not done things perfectly, I've, that maybe there's something that I did on my own instead of with him. No, I have checks and balances every single day. I always go back to him to make sure that I'm in step with him. I'm always asking him so that when people come on the channel and they start accusing me of speaking, you know, whatever, whatever, or of being whatever, whatever, I know it's a lie. I know that it's a lie. I know it's an accusation that comes from the devil because I know that I go back to God. The devil's just trying to sucker punch me right now because I'm low. But God's also doing something in this. He's squeezing out all of that. Any doubt, any lie, any cowardice, any trauma that needs to be processed. He's squeezing out the last bit of toothpaste out of the tube. And if we don't, if we're not up against a wall, if we're not going through this, it's very difficult to get to those things because we're too comfortable 
to go there. We have to be uncomfortable enough. We have to be brought low enough to get those little cr- those crumbs. You know, I guess I'll use the toothpaste analogy, okay? You haven't gone to the store yet to get another tube of toothpaste. You're really going to squeeze that tube and get every last bit out of it because you don't have a backup. But if you have a backup, you're going to be like, I'm not going to sit here and mess with this thing. I've got another one up in the cupboard. Let me go get it. You get what I'm saying? So when you don't have a backup, when you've been placed in a situation, God has brought you to a situation where there's no backup for God. Now you're going to work on that too. And you're going to get the last bits of toothpaste out of there. That's what God's doing. He doesn't bring grief willingly, but there is a purpose. He does nothing without cause. He does nothing without cause.